I'd like to take your Bibles and join me again in the book of Peter, 1 Peter. And uh, we're going to continue on in this uh, portion of Scripture today. Uh, I... I, I don't think there's any other portion of Scripture, I, I was thinking about this week, that I read more to others than this portion of Scripture. Uh, it might be one you might want to bracket, dog ear, the, uh, the top of the page. I've got a ribbon in it, okay? Uh, and usually, if I've ever visited you in the hospital and you were going in for surgery, odds are I read this portion of Scripture to you and depending on where you were in your faith, I might have even walked you through it. Uh, I read it to those who are going through difficult times because it puts problems into the right perspective and it allows us to see past these temporary difficulties and it reminds us uh, that the problems that we have or these difficulties we have are not only necessary but ultimately will be profitable for us. Uh, it's at times like this where our focus is on us. And when we focus on us, us, our thinking tends to go into a downward spiral because our situation isn't so good at that time. And we want to be able to lift ourselves out of us and get our eyes back on our hope. And that is in the Lord. And this is a portion of scripture that does that so well. It, uh, this portion of scripture is uh, will be helpful to listeners, uh, even more helpful to the listeners of it who understand what Peter is saying. Uh, so I'd like you to drink in the words. We're going to look at verses. Uh, we're going to reread what we looked at last week and go down to verse 9 uh, this morning because it all, it all comes together. And uh, we're going to move through verses, first few verses starting at verse 3 today. So, reading, it says, written uh, by Peter, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it's written to those, we learned this last week, who are the elect exiles of the dispersion. These are Gentile Christians who uh, are suffering persecution uh, in uh, Asia, in and around the Mediterranean Sea, up northern area, around Greece and around that around that. Uh, uh, portion of the Bosporus Straits and down the down the Turkish uh, coastline there, and they are being persecuted, so they're being pushed out of their homes, and they're moving into areas that we will understand some. We will recognize some of these words uh, into uh, Galatia, into Pontus, into Cappadocia, into Asia, and uh, Bithynia, and and you who are these written to these elect exiles. Uh, who, who have been dispersed according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, who have been sanctified of the Spirit uh, for their obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. These are believers who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit lives within them, and their sins have been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. And he says to you who I am writing, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to... Uh, see, we haven't read all the way through it yet, have we? Let's read all the way through it. Let's go, let's go ahead and three, and then we'll go back and do this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is refined by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, allow this portion of Scripture to be in one sense utilitarian, that we would use it to encourage others when our friends are hurting, when our friends are discouraged, that we would know where to go to bring you into that situation. But beyond utilitarian, Lord, may it change our minds, our hearts, our lives. May it give us your perspective so that we can meet the trials of our life with the same strength of truth that you have given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's go back. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to just say a word about blessed be. Uh, if some of you are reading the NIV, and you have the NIV, uh, I, this is one of those portions of Scripture that I never tried to memorize, but I found out later that I had it memorized. Uh, and uh, the NIV starts out, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in, the, in the ESV and most of the other translations, we find blessed be. The Greek word here is eulogetos. Eulogetos. that sound like any English word you've ever heard before? It's where we get our word eulogy. It's where we get our word eulogy. Yesterday, uh, Frank Marshall's funeral was here, and we set aside a time in the service for friends and family to eulogize Frank or to speak well of him, to speak well of him. The things we can say about any person that are good are the things about him or her that reflect God or the goodness of God. There is no other goodness. Uh, like, uh, it's like truth. Goodness is defined by God. Uh, now, let me say this about, just, just, this, just thinking about eula, uh, eulogizing again. I really think it would be really good for the church, for all of us in all aspects of our lives, to eulogize each other all the time and not wait until we're dead, okay? Just saying. Uh, I think too often our human nature will naturally speak about people in ne negative ways. Our human nature will bring up the things about people that maybe are not very reflective of God. We tend to concentrate on the things about people that aren't admirable. There is no admonition in the scriptures ever to do that. There's no gift of divine criticism, okay? It just, it isn't there. But how would our lives change? How would the atmosphere of any organization or church or family change if the only things we said out loud about one another to other people were the things about us that reflect Christ? Okay? Think about that. Think about all the nastiness that would go away and thinking about the encouragement that would replace it. You're not lying, okay? And you can't lie. You can't say things about, can't say good things about people that aren't true. But every human being, even non believers, are made in the image of God and reflect God to some degree or another. And those are the things that we need to encourage in them. My mother in law said, if you give a dog a name, he'll live up to it every time. So if we're in the habit of, saying bad things about people, and those people hear what we're saying about them, that can be prophetical. That can be self-prophecy. And you'll see this in children all the time. Well, I'm just stupid. Well, why do you say that? Well, my dad tells me I'm just stupid. Okay? And you know, it's like, a, it's like pronouncing a curse on your child when you do that. Okay? Uh, how did God make them? What do they carry with them that reflects the glory of God? And those are the things we need to say about them to them and to others about them. Uh, <clears throat> so what is going to follow this blessed be 
or praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be reasons for us to speak well of God. Okay? This is what we're about to be fed now. Reasons to speak well of God. And we should expect now to read about how good God is. Uh, so we read, we go on, and it says, according to, now I want you to think about how, I'm going to read just a little bit of this, and you tell me how many good things about God you've heard, you hear. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. I mean, just that little portion of a sentence is packed, jammed with good things about God. And we have been the recipients. We who have placed our faith in him have, are the recipients of these blessings. The first word I want to point out is according to. My guess is you probably didn't pick that one up. Okay, In accordance to. Working together in harmony to bring about God's perfect will. Your life being set and harmoniously orchestrated by God when we, when we are obedient to him to bring about his perfect will in our lives. How many of you control all of the influences in your life? All of them. Raise your hand. 98%? 90%? In fact, the truth is, most of us don't control much of the influences in our life. This is one of the reasons God says, love me. Love me. And if you love me, you'll obey my commands because I love you. And I will bring harmony to your life. So the various things that come into your life, whether good or bad, will bring about God's perfect will for you and for the other people that you touch. You see, that's an amazing promise. That's an amazing good thing about God because all the, I mean, I have things that affect me and I don't even know they're there. I have things affect me that are genetic that were determined by somebody behind a wood pile 600 years ago. Okay? That was kind of a crude way to say it behind. Well, I don't know what my relatives were doing. Well, I guess if they were. Well, never mind. All right. <laughs> but what control do I have over my genetic makeup? What control do I have over thoughts that came into my mind through other people speaking that I didn't want to listen to? But they're there. Okay? Uh, God works out those things harmoniously to bring about his perfect will. Then the word mercy should have popped up, I would imagine. When a person does not receive the punishment or penalty that they rightly deserve. I love mercy, by the way. I do not want what I deserve. People say, hey, Dave, how you doing? I say, better than I deserve. Uh, and I think I was saying that before Dave, what's his name, the financial guy, whoever he is. So, uh, But it's just, it just makes perfect sense to me. If there's anything I know, I, and Pete, when I say that to non-believers who know I'm a pastor, who think I'm a really good guy, and they really don't know, uh, they just assume it. They say, oh, no, you deserve so. And I said, no, I don't. No, I don't. I do not, I, if there's anything I know, I know I don't want what I deserve. I love mercy, I love grace. But here, Peter, uh, in terms of the mercy that he mentions, is speak, teaching about our spiritual birth. We find out that moment when we receive the Holy Spirit and are born into a new life that was made possible because of Jesus' death on our behalf. The word mercy is a reminder that we have been adopted into the family of God through no merit of our own. Okay? God loved us. It wasn't like Jesus 
like God walked into a, uh, a divine orphanage and says, oh, she's so cute, I want to adopt her. Or, my goodness, he's a nice, sturdy young man, I want to adopt him. Or perhaps uh, a child on his best behavior, and God says, oh, my goodness, that child really takes life seriously, and I want him for my son. God didn't do that. He brought us into his family not because of who we were. He chose us because of who he is, because of his great love for us, not through any merit of our own. God causes us to be born into his kingdom because of his loving mercy. Those are two words that go together very well. Loving mercy. Next words we see there is he caused us to be born again. He, God, caused us to be born again. And this phrase, born again, is only found two places in the Bible. The first place is when Jesus uses it as he explains salvation to Nicodemus. And the second place is here in 1 Peter. I'd like to go back to the book of John, chapter 3. If you want to join me there, I'm going to read a little bit of this. And let's look at Jesus' use of born again. Like I say, if we're going to use 1 Peter 3 to minister to others, it's good that we understand it well. In John chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading at verse 3. And here we read of a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was a big shooter in Jerusalem. And this man came to Jesus by night. Now, why was Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night? Probably because he was very, very well known, and he didn't want everyone to know that he was going to visit this rabbi, this teacher that is very controversial. Uh, and it was probably somewhat of a clandestine operation, sneaking through the dark streets of Jerusalem to meet with Jesus. And he, and he goes into the home where Jesus was staying, and, uh, and he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. In other words, they'd acknowledge the miracles that they were seeing Jesus doing. They also knew that Jesus spoke with an authority that was unhuman, Okay. Uh, it was an authority that the people had not, were not used to hearing from their religious leaders. Jesus answered him. And I have to tell you, if I was one of Jesus' disciples, he would have drove me nuts. Because whenever you ask Jesus a question, his answer never seems to have anything to do with what you just ask. Okay? I mean, that's just me. And, I, and when I read the Bible, especially when I read Jesus, uh, it makes, I, I have to stop and say, why did he say that? Okay. In light of what was just asked, why did he say that? And I'm convinced over the years that Jesus does that on purpose. Okay. I don't think Jesus wants us glossing over anything that he says. And I think he not only wants us to think about these things, I think he wants us to think deeply about him about them, okay? So he's, so, and so this is what he says. He says to, to Nicodemus, and by the way, Jesus did have the advantage of knowing Nicodemus better than Nicodemus knew himself, okay? Truly, truly, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, okay? Now, there's Jesus knew what Nicodemus was there for. Nicodemus was trying to figure out who Jesus was, and he was trying to figure out salvation. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he, enter in, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I don't know how you read this. When I read this, I feel an edge to Nicodemus's reply. Like, what do you tell me that for? That's stupid. You can't, you know. And he, it's almost like he doesn't like what Jesus says. And there's a little bit of sarcasm even that comes back with it. Uh, Jesus, not to be sidetracked by sarcasm, answers Nicodemus. Answering, this is what Jesus does, by the way. He answers your heart, not so much your words. 
Okay? He says, truly, truly. In other words, and whenever you see a word repeated, that's, get, you just give it extra emphasis. If you're using a King James, what's the word they use in King James? Verily. Yeah, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus then says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, these things are beyond your capability of understanding. Okay? Just like you don't understand in the pattern of the winds, you're not going to understand what the Holy Spirit does and how the Holy Spirit does what it does. So Nicodemus says to Jesus, well, how can these things be? How can they be? And Jesus answered him, a little biting here, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Again, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. In other words, Jesus sees inside of Nicodemus some doubt. Okay? If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how do you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Who is Jesus talking about here? Himself. He is revealing to Nicodemus that he is the one who understands this because he descended from heaven. He knows heaven. And just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and Nicodemus knows that, he is a ruler of the Jews, uh, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And this is uh, a prophecy of sorts of his own crucifixion. And anyone who looked to the serpent was what? In the Old Testament? Healed. And anyone who looks to Jesus will find spiritual healing. And now the famous verse, I mean, how many is John 3, 16, the first verse you ever memorized? Anybody? Okay, I think it was for me. For God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he gave his only son. I don't know if he looked at, I, I, I don't know what Nicodemus got here. You know, did Jesus pause and say, and you're looking at him, buddy? <laughs> okay, I don't know. But he's talking about himself. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Back to the salvation question, which was really why Nicodemus was there. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. By the way, there is a sharp contrast between Jesus' ministry and the ministry of of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, who were all about condemnation when people disobeyed the law. And that is not where Jesus was. Jesus did not come in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus said, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. This is the truth, Nicodemus. Light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. The light was antithetical to their very being. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. You ever wonder why it's so hard for people in the entertainment industry to embrace Christ? People who uh, live their lives in a libertarian way 
And I don't mean that politically so much as people who live their lives uh, and what is most important to them is that they be able to do whatever they want to do. And that is their core value. I want to be able to do whatever I want you to do, and I don't want anybody telling me what's right and wrong. I don't want anybody telling me what I can and can't do. And these people would be antinomial. They would be against the law. The problem with that is all laws restrict people. That is the purpose of laws, to restrict people. And the best of laws restrict people from hurting themselves or hurting others. That is what laws are for. And so you have people whose very profession hurts people. And I would say these days in our country, morally. Okay? I don't want anybody to tell me that I can't have pornography. I don't want anybody to tell me that I can't drink as much as I want. I don't want anybody to tell me that I can't take this substance or that substance into my body. I should be able to do absolutely whatever I want to do. And the law says, but we love you. And we don't want you to destroy yourself. So we will make a law to protect you from yourself, which will also protect others from you. So this is the thinking, okay? This is the thinking behind that. Uh, and this is why some people hate Christianity so much. This is why some people hate certain parts of the established government that want to make laws that will limit their expression, you see. The pro now, do these people normally think what they're doing is bad? I don't, many of them don't. They've, their consciences have been seared or calloused, and uh, many of them think they're doing the world a favor to, uh, to offer, th th offer the world things that are morally repugnant to God and should be to us. Unfortunately, so many times our own minds and hearts get seared along with theirs. But the interesting thing is these people would never say that they're not good people. They perceive themselves as good people, and they perceive their causes as good cause. It makes it a very difficult battle. But verse 20 goes on to say, Jesus still teaching, everyone who does wicked things really hates the light and does not come to the light. This is why... Uh, I have all sorts of public figures in mind who talk about how much they love Jesus, but do you notice they have to re redefine Jesus to love him? Okay, They don't like the Jesus that talks about sin, but they only like the Jesus that talks about love and acceptance. Okay, So you have to, re if you, if you want to have Jesus in your life and be antinomial, you have to redefine him so he really isn't who he was. Because they really don't like the real Jesus. They hate, things hate the light and does not come to the light lest their works be exposed for what they really are, which is destructive by nature and sinful. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. By the way, you ever wonder if you're good or not? How good are you? Want to know how good you are? Just stand next to Jesus. <laughs> I used to think I was, I, think, I used to think I really understood football well played football, watched football my whole, whole life, and then I went to a Badger game with Dale Maher and Rick Osgood and a guy named Fred Cool, who's in the Wisconsin Hall of Fame for football. And I sat with those three guys, all of them varsity coaches, either in Baraboo or the Dells, and Fred Cool at the college level. And I sat and watched a football game with those guys, and I walked away thinking, I don't know diddly squat about football, okay? <laughs> But when I stood next to my 10-year-old son, I, was, I had it, man. I, I knew this stuff. You want to know how good an athlete you are? Play with the best. You want to know how righteous you are? Stand next to Jesus. How do you do? 
That's, yeah, we're out of time. We're going to start talking next week about the living hope. And this is a, such a critical part of what we're talking about. We who are blessed with a living hope. And we're going to talk about what that means. Uh, and I, and the, the whole concept of a living hope to me okay, is something that we have. That we, it's, like a, it's like a tool on our workbench that can do, that mul, has multifunctions. Okay? And we don't know how to use it. So it just sets on our workbench. Okay? The fact that we are people who live with a living hope should radically change our perspective of everything. And we'll start talking about that next week. Stand up, would you please? I really shouldn't have to rush because the placards don't play till 7.30. So <laughs> give me another couple hours this morning. How's that? Heavenly Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here in this room. Thank you for those who will become my brothers and sisters in this room, Lord, as they draw close to the light and they see your beauty and they see your perfection, Lord. And you place within their hearts a love for you that is undeniable, Lord, and they walk from death into life through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, these are wonderful things of which we speak, Lord. And we say hallelujah. When we look at the world around us and we see the battles that are being fought in and amongst uh, humans that are so ugly and so sad, Lord, we give you thanks that the spiritual battles are being won and we will be victorious in you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.